thank you. It's great to have you all here. Thanks for inviting me to come and share some just thoughts and information about SPO. Just to get us going, let's look at our objectives for today. Um, as soon as I can get the system going, there we are. All right, so we're looking to review the background information for the design and development of SPO. We're going to discuss some of the influence of the SPO products on the neuro and biomechanical systems. We're gonna review some research articles regarding the impact of SPO and lycra compression. And we will look at some videos to discuss what's happening before and after the SPO products are put on. And then um, think about considerations for choosing a product. We are, Christy and I are joining you from the Pacific Northwest where all SPO products are made, distributed, our offices are located here. And we at SPO acknowledge that we are on the unceded and ancestral lands of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, the Coast Salish, the Mukilteo, and Puyallup people. People and cultures that have been here for generations and are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. Further, we respectfully acknowledge the enslaved people, primarily of African descent, who provided exploited labor on which this country was built with little to no recognition. Today, we are indebted to their labor and the labor of many black and brown bodies in our community. At SPIO, we strive to be good stewards and partners with the land and the people we share space and work with. And if you're interested in learning more about our efforts, please feel free to reach out. I also want to acknowledge and extend my gratitude to Nancy Hilton. As Kyle mentioned, she is a physiotherapist and an orthotist who is a co-inventor of SPO. She has been my mentor for several years. And she also is one of the founders of Children's Therapy Center, which is a nonprofit organization here in Seattle. We provide both early intervention and outpatient services. We have OT, PT, speech, and 100% of SPIO's profits go to supporting um, that work. So why do we care? <laughs> why SPIO? Um, you all might already be familiar with Can Child's tongue-in-cheek and affectionately dubbed F-words for um, helping us imagine the ICF framework. And I think this is really what it's all about. Um, we can pretty quickly see how SPIO might be supporting the body structure and function for our patients. And with that, we really are hoping that we're supporting their ability to participate in activities and just those everyday activities with their friends and community. SPIO's roots um, are completely intertwined in the family. It was designed with families and it has continued to evolve and be tweaked over time um, based on the feedback we're getting from the individuals that wear these products and those that live and support and care for them. And ultimately, we're really striving to support people and having a full and rich life. We um, went to remove as many barriers as possible for them. And um, thinking of those of us who have the patients that are younger, we, we see this little person and the body they have now, and we're thinking about how to support the moment that we're in, but we also have our eyes on the future. How can we um, support the now while also protecting the structures so that that rich and fulfilling life of participation can carry on into the future. The history of SPIO begins in the late 90s when um, Cheryl Allen, who was a parent, had these two boys that were coming in to have therapy with Nancy. They presented with two different forms of cerebral palsy, um, but both had some motor deficits. And in the just course of therapy and exploration, um, they started playing around with compression, uh, an ACE wrap, um, some um, trunk compressions, compression to the legs, and they were noticing some nice positive changes, improved uh, sitting balance, um, some improved mobility and transitional movements. And 
Cheryl as a seamstress um, was like, I think we could maybe find a way to, to make something. Maybe I could make something that we could use at home. And so together they looked at fabrics, they looked at um, just designs, and that was the beginning of SPIO. It's definitely evolved over time. And while it was, its roots are looking at the population of children with cerebral palsy, it's now used with children with a variety of diagnoses. So hypotonia, various syndromes, like Down syndrome, Angelman syndrome, Rett syndrome, um, muscular atrophy, brachial plexus injury, autism, sensory processing disorder, um, et cetera, et cetera. With SPIO, we are really hoping that we are facilitating improvements in reduced hypertonus, improving somatosensory awareness. We want to increase that dynamic stability and balance. We're hoping to improve their movement and motor control and posture and muscle readiness. And it is giving us those um, results through some influence to both the neurosystem and the biomechanical system. So we're just gonna spend some time thinking about how it might play out in both of those areas. Let's start off with the neurosystem. So we all, we all have these patients on our caseload. And when we think of these children who have some neuromotor deficits, some themes start to um, come up to the surface. So we might frequently see children who are struggling with issues of instability, particularly in those triplanar motions. So um, those tasks that require an active core stabilization and balance in order to do um, th those transition movements or activities. We also see deficits in sensory awareness where there's a limited process and awareness of where is my body in space? What is the mind body edge? What is me? What is not me? And from that, how do I build my plan to navigate the world? We also see deficits in motor control, which then can result in those limited movement options or a limited repertoire of movement patterns. And we can also see an unpredictability of motor responses. And for those children who you just never really know how your body is going to act, um, it can be rather frightening to try new, more challenging things. So let's take a moment to think about motor control specifically. We know that in order to have an efficient motor plan, we need to have efficient registration, integration, and feedback from the somatosensory system. And we know that deep pressure is a primary somatosensory input that amongst other things is feeding that three-dimensional cortical body map, which underlies all movement control and body, muscle, soft tissue, and joint awareness. We know that these brain maps are neuroplastic and that they are responsive to any sensory input received. The compression of SPIO products helps provide input to those peripheral mechanoreceptors. So they're located in the skin, in the muscles, and in the joints. And the athletic world has recently been, its curiosity has been piqued um, about compression garments and um, done some work looking at like what's happening with this compression. So here's a study done by a group in British Columbia where they took 25 neurologically intact participants, um, which we probably can guess were grad students, um, and they fit a custom leg wrist sleeve. So across the elbow joint, and um, they had them participate in various reaching tasks. And their findings showed that there was an alteration, that there was improved excitability and improved reaching accuracy. And as they were, um, all their little electrodes were able to distinguish like which um, mechanoreceptors were firing, and they noted that there was an increase in both the cutaneous and the muscle afferent sensory pathways, and then that was true across the multiple movement tasks. Part of their conclusions were that 
this compression may be assisting as a type of a filter for the mechanoreceptors, leading to that increased precision and movement sensitivity around the joint where the compression was applied. And then what about the patients that we work with, <laughs> the kids that we're more familiar with? Um, so a similar style of um, input was looked at by this group in Australia. So they had a lycra arm splint for children with cerebral palsy. So they had 16 children with spastic and dystonic hypertonia randomly grouped into an intervention group and then the control group being those on the wait list. Um, these children were ages nine to 14 and they were assessed across three months of wearing this, this splint and also participating in goal-directed training. And they were looking at um, outcomes with the goal attainment measure and also some 3D upper limb and trunk kin kinematics while doing various reaching tasks. So they noticed that there were improvements immediately upon donning the splint and that those improvements continued to um, grow across over across the three months of intervention. The most notable improvements were in elbow extension, shoulder flexion and abduction, and thorax flexion. Also, all but one child achieved their movement goals within that three month period. This same cohort of children um, with the same splint, they also looked at wrist kinematics during some reaching tasks and specifically looking at the fluency of movement. How fluid were their movements? So were they able to move and flow smoothly and freely without jerkiness or tremor? And part of that was breaking down the reach into the primary movement, so that ballistic controlled phase um, versus the secondary final corrective phase. So I'm reaching for the thing, I have the big movement and then that final tweak to um, get the precision I need for success in the task. Um, at baseline, they noticed that these children spent more time in that secondary corrective stage, but after the three months of intervention, that started to shift. So their percentage of time was more that faster primary movement and less of the slower secondary refinement needed to be successful. That those improvements were noted for all the, all the children with cerebral palsy who had the intervention, that their movements were faster, more efficient, and required less of those secondary corrections. Um, the movement specifically was reduction in movement time, jerk index, normalized jerk, and that percentage of time um, and jerk in the primary and secondary movements. They also noted that the improvements were that much greater for the children with dystonia. It's interesting to think about this one where we're thinking of children who um, have an element of spasticity, which we know is velocity dependent, and they're also looking at speed. And so kind of exciting to see how it can, it can help with that area. So that circumferential compression that we're getting through the Lycra that SPIO is providing is giving input to those deep pressure receptors, which are stimulated with even very small increments of movement. So there doesn't appear to be any sensory receptor adaptation to the stimulation because even those subtle movements change the orientation of pressure on the receptors and keeps them actively firing. And this permits full-time wear of the aphosis with continued body awareness while, while they're in it. As this child, as the person is better able to feel their body, especially their core musculature, they're more easily able to activate and grade combined muscle strategies for balance, for active postural adjustments, for active stability, and transitional movements. And what we've seen um, what I've seen in my practice, so this is a little more anecdotally, but at the beginning stages, it might be that, wow, like when we have it on, I'm really seeing that. And then over time with continued wear and continued practice, just the repetition um, throughout the day, there can be an expansion of carryover so that 
um, for some of those younger children, they may wear it for a time and then um, as they get older, not, not need that support anymore. So for these children who have decreased muscle activity or hypotonia, we often see a kind of observable waking up. So when we put this BO on, it's like, broop, they're, they're awake and um, those motor units are firing. Um, it can be really exciting to see those changes. Um, we see that then is supporting more active balance. It's improving their graded movement control. And um, in many situations, we see them sort of spontaneously trying new things that we hadn't seen them trying without this BO. And then um, sort of the other presentation we see um, for those who have poor motor control and instability, they may use a compensatory strategy of increased tension in their soft tissue and muscles. So you can have this underlying spasticity or increased um, that velocity dependent um, tension, but layered on top of that, this dynamic stiffness um, of a child trying to gain stability or trying to increase their awareness of that part of their body. So when that is the case, we notice that when we're putting this compression, putting the spew on, that there's a reduction of tension that they can um, let go and um, have better dynamic control and stability. And as mentioned earlier in this slide, there's this component of fear. So for uh, when you, a child whose responses are maybe inconsistent or it's just a fuzzy body edge, what's me, what's not me? Um, <laughs> if I fall, how far will I fall? Um, the fear factor is real. And if we think about this, just as an example, if you and I, we might be walking along on a sidewalk and we're having a conversation and we just, I'm walking fluidly. I can comfortably turn my body, have a conversation with you. We're going along, a car might even drive past, no worries. But if we took that same sidewalk, the same pavement and elevated it 20 feet in the air, my fear would increase significantly. And what might that look like in my body? Without a neural impact, my posture and movement is going to change. I probably would rather you not be next to me. <laughs> um, I'm going to move a little bit slower. My movements are going to be less fluid. My ability to scan the environment is likely going to be limited. I'm probably going to be a bit more tunnel vision. Just keeping my eye on the prize to stay on track. I may hunch down or try to lower my center of mass. And um, I'm I, just thinking about it, I feel my body stiffening. <laughs> so um, we can have these posture and movement responses that are rooted in fear and a decreased sense of security. And what's been neat to hear from our patients is that they report feeling an increased sense of safety and stability when they're wearing this BO product. And that feeling of greater safety has a neurologic impact on the limbic system, on our frontal lobe premotor cortex, which is supporting them in trusting their body and feeling more comfortable testing the limits of their motor control. So we've got a video here to watch together and think about what we're seeing and oh no guys i'm so sorry it's not playing oh dear oh christy i can see <laughs> let me see if i can pull it up and um we'll i'll let you know when i when i get it okay thank you i'm so sorry everyone I, and you know what, we'd even practiced, we practiced this yesterday and it worked and now it's like, the file's not here. Okay, well, while Christy looks for that, we'll just carry on. Um, we're gonna watch her in um, standing and in, in sitting. I wonder, Christy, if we go to the Dropbox, if that might be the easiest place to, to get the clips. Okay, one second. Um, thank you. Okay, well, 
So we're going to hold those um, neurophysiological components in mind and then switch and think a little bit about the biomechanical system. And while we're dividing these for the purpose of discussing them, um, we know in reality that they're constantly interacting and um, we're having considerations of both for every patient. Um, so through the work of Mary Mastery and Paul Hodges, we have a better understanding of how the positive pressure of the abdominal and thoracic cavities is so critical for core stability. Mary Mastery's soda can model, if um, you're not familiar with it, is she talks about how the material of a, a soda can is really not particularly structurally significant, right? It's very thin, it's rather flimsy, um, but when the system is closed, it's got some pretty great structural integrity. And so the benefit of that positive pressure maintained internally is helping provide and foster greater stability. And then she alludes like, okay, that's the soda can. And what does that look like in our body? So we have our core musculature, our abdominals, and then we have our vocal folds and our pelvic floor is our top and bottom. And then inside we have the diaphragm, which is regulating the pressure. So it's regulating pressure. We all um, learned a lot about how it's so important for our respiratory system, but also thinking of how it might play into other um, systems. And that we are constantly needing to adjust the level of stiffness. So it's a dynamic control and the an integrity of that system is going to impact the strength and function, but also that dynamic nature of achieving the optimal control of balancing the movement and the stiffness necessary for each unique task's requirements really relies on the ability to generate, maintain, and regulate the pressure within the trunk. So that will impact our posture and movement system, it's going to influence our respiratory system. It impacts our GI system. <laughs> There's just a lot of things that are contained in there. And so the alignment and function of that part of our body can have a cascade of impact. I think I've got the video queued up. Okay, can I just do the next two slides? And yep. then, um, sure. that's great. thanks so much, Christine. Yep. Um, so if, I'm relying on my diaphragm for postural control. So maybe in order to generate enough pressure to have a lot of stability, and we do this um, in short bursts, right? I'm lifting something heavy. I'm pushing something that has a lot of resistance. And to get a little more oomph, I'm going to contract my diaphragm, hold the pressure in. Probably I might even hold my breath a little or grunt. <clears throat> um, and in short little bursts and for those specific tasks, that's great, wonderfully functional. But if I need that to just balance and stay upright, what are the um, cascade of effects? Well, I might struggle to speak. If I'm using my diaphragm to really hold, then it's hard to have a fluid control of my voice and the air that is that eccentric control to have a long sentence. Um, it might be much harder for me to take a good breath. And so the impact over time um, can be pretty detrimental. And if I am actually holding my breath, well, there really is only so long that I can do that. So we're thinking in this context of how the spheoorthosis can assist in that biomechanical containment and improve the efficiency of the core muscle team externally. And that balanced circumferential pressure is also supporting the soft tissue and joint structures in a more neutral alignment. So thinking of that length tension curve we all had in school and supporting our um, that optimal muscle range for optimal performance, <laughs> um, getting that containment to bring us into that position is also fostering more typical biomechanical chain reactions and thus supporting active balance centering, stabilizing, and grading of movement. So we know that um, that spio fabric, and you maybe you're all familiar with this from your um, 
attendance with presentations with Kin. We have all these different products and the Lycra itself was chosen and designed to provide an even and multi-directional st stretch. So there's a very high rebound memory to support that biomechanical containment and um, allowing movement in all, in all planes. So this unique combination allows the person to move in all directions with guided resistance. As they move away from midline, the fabric and the design help guide them back to their neutral physiological alignment for the improved balance. And this is supporting muscle strength and combined muscle strategies. In order to get that effect though, the orthosis needs to fit snugly enough that it's not slipping against the body. It needs to maintain that intimate fit on the skin during all of those movements. Um, okay, well, I have a couple studies, but maybe, um, Christy, if we do the video to talk through that, I, um, I think I need to stop sharing so you can share, yeah? Yeah. So this little girl presents with some dyskinesia and we'll watch her in, um, okay, we'll do sitting first. Can you so, see that? Yes, thank you. Okay. thank you. Okay, so on the left we have her without the SPO and then on the right with um, the TLSO and the LBO. Great. So we can see she's having um, she's able to recruit muscles, but oh no. Okay, it's sort of pausing for me. So I may, I hope it's more fluid for you all. Um, so she can recruit a muscle, but she's having a hard time sustaining that activation over time. And she's got this really asymmetrical pull that she falls into. Um, she can kind of come back with help, but she's really needing um, a lot of support. So we can appreciate some of the neuro factors of how is she able to recruit and sustain the muscle and motor units over time? And how is she getting those um, combined muscle groups activating together? And then also biomechanically. So how, um, how efficient <laughs> is she in regulating, maintaining pressure in her trunk for breathing, for posture and movement? Etc. Um, and then, if you don't mind playing it one more time, Christy. Mm -hmm. um, so now, looking at the right, mm -hmm. what what are we noticing is changing? So her base of support is much quieter and more stable now. She's able to um, sustain those um, co contractions and bring her center of mass within her base of support more effectively. And um, she just needs a lot less support. To, to get and to stay in the sitting position. Um, she's able to, to prop on that arm a little more effectively as well. Okay. And then, I don't know, did you have the one of her in standing by any chance? Could you pull that one up too? Sure, let me check. Okay. Thanks. Great. There we go. Yeah. So here too, like she can, she can turn on a muscle, but that consistent steady um, contraction is hard for her. Um, at the beginning, if you can see in the left leg, she sort of locks it up. She goes to end range to try to get some stability and then she sort of loses it and collapses. So it's an all or nothing um, that we're seeing and the level of support required. So she's got trunk, hip, she's sort of, sandwiched against Nancy's body for stability. And then when we have the support of the TLSO and the LBO, her, again, her base of support is um, more consistent. It's a little bit quieter and steadier, which is allowing her to take on a little bit more of the balance herself. So she's not needing the same degree of assistance where it was max assistance before. Now, like there's actually a gap between her body and Nancy's for the majority of the time. And then just another consideration um, for both motor planning and just general participation is her ability to access her vision. So if we're going to make a plan, we um, 
for those of us who use our vision, that's a huge part of deciding what do I want to do? Where do I want to go? And if our, um, the, if our base is so unpredictable and so unstable, how do we accurately lock on to something? How do we find, visually find and fixate on a target to then make an efficient plan? And so she kind of looks at some things in the pre, um, granted the target is closer, <laughs> which is helping her in the post, but you can also just see how much um, steadier her head is so it's easier for her eyes and her visual system to um, see something and make a plan to interact with it. Great. Thank you so much, Christy. <laughs> um, I think if you wanted to sort of plan ahead if we have this same problem later on, um, three videos at the end are the girl with the ball, and then our little guy walking and the, um, the other girl walking, if you don't mind. Um, I'm so sorry, everyone. We really did. Oh, that. I'm sorry. My um, sound just clicked out. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so the video clip of the girl throwing the ball and the boy walking and then our other um, little friend walking with the TLSO enhancement. Okay. Thank you. Whew. All right, just flexing on the fly. All right, <laughs> so um, let's look at a few more studies. These are more looking at the TLSO and some balance, some posture and sitting balance. So this first study, um, well, these two, it's the same cohort. Um, and they were using this BO TLSO they randomly assigned 24 children age range of three to eight who presented with mild to moderate spastic CP and they were randomly assorted, sorted into three groups. So the first group was exercise only, so we could say just traditional therapy. Um, the second group had that plus two hours of wearing the TLSO and then the third group had the same exercise regimen, but with six hours of wearing the TLSO, and they followed them for six months. So at the end of that, they noticed that um, there were significant um, changes in both groups who had the SPO, um, changes in their kyphotic angles and their cob angles. Um, the migration index did not show a statistically significant difference. Um, however, they're interestingly enough using this BO for two and six hours a day had similar outcomes. Um, and then again, this, so the same cohort, same children, same three groups and intervention, um, but this time looking at their sitting balance. And um, similar to the one with the arm sleeve and the reaching, like this group also noticed there were improvements immediately upon donning the orthosis and they continue to improve over time. In fact, all the groups did show improvements in their sitting assessment scale, but it was significantly greater for those who had been wearing this VO. All right, well, there we were gonna yep. talk about that again, but that's fine. We've, we've already kind of covered that one. I have the other videos ready whenever you're ready. Okay, great. We'll be there in just a couple slides. Thank you. Um, so in summary, the dynamic nature of SPO products allows for multiple repetitions throughout the day of a more balanced, stable, and variable movement. And through its dynamic containment, it's supporting more challenging movement and balance. It's providing consistent and specific sensory input to assist with improved body awareness. And we know that is important for feed forward and feedback. And it's supporting movement to be more free, to be easier, and more motivating. So here we are. What do we choose? <laughs> um, I'm sure you all have a patient in mind um, that you're thinking of. And again, I know Ken has gone over and um, Kyle maybe has also helped go through all the choices that are available, but which one do we pick? So um, to get started, I would say, start thinking with what level of support does this child need? And 
even more specifically, what's going on at their trunk? How much trunk control do they have? How much trunk support do they need? Do you feel like any instabilities or challenges in that area? Are they influencing things distally with reach or gait, et cetera? Um, what, what's the primary change? What are you going for? Um, what change are you hoping to make? And what, what's been working well? You, you've been working with this patient. You've got your toolbox of things that you've tried. What are you noticing they respond to? What seem to be the challenges? What kind of um, support has been the most effective or what kind of input has had the greatest um, impact so far? And then what's their age? What's their level of independence? Um, we don't want to sacrifice <laughs> independence for um, uh, with, with a device. And we also want to think about what's going to be realistic for follow through. What will this ch child and family be willing or capable of following through with um, over time? Because our goal is really to use the lowest level of support necessary to get that desired outcome. And so you go through that checklist, you think about, okay, here's my plan, and then we're gonna try something. And how you try it, um, I know we um, have had some just trial kits. So we've got a range of TLSOs, LBOs, and UBOs. And then also the Fabreflex, which has been a really cool um, adjunct to this process. So if you have something on hand to try, um, it sure can make this decision process easier. You, you don't need to, but it does make it easier. So let's say we um, are like, okay, we're gonna make our guess. We're gonna, we're gonna try you know, the, the TLSO. And so you put it on and what happens? Because we wanna see a change. We wanna um, be making some kind of impact on that child's function. And give it like five or 10 minutes. Um, they're gonna be adjusting to it and you'll be noticing what changes you're seeing. And it might be that you're like, mm, okay, we got a little bit, but I think we need a little bit more. And it might be we need more mechanical support. It might be we need um, a, a different area supported. Um, and so you could either add another layer or you could add another product and then watch again, see what happens. Um, for some, you're gonna see that right away immediate change. And for others, it, it might be more of a gradual ramp up. Um, I know I had one kid that we, we tried it and we're like, yep, yeah, I, I, think, I think we're getting something, but I just left the item with them. I'm like, you know what, let's try this. And so the next afternoon, so it was about 24 hours and the mom like sent me a text and she's like, oh my goodness. Like he just really wasn't using his arms. Like, putting things together. And she's like, he just fed himself like his whole meal. And before he'd been like a little baby bird. Um, so the, the timing can be different. Just every body responds differently to that input. And on occasion, you will have someone that this is not the product for them. Um, so there is that 30 day return. Um, we, we want you to try it. And we also want to make it easy if it's, if it's not the right thing. Um, we, we want to support that too. All right, so if we could um, try that video. So we're just gonna do a little bit of like problem solving together and um, how, do, how do we decide? <laughs> um, so I will stop sharing here and then Christy, if you don't mind sharing that video. Um, so this- Actually, this um, that one I didn't get up, but I have um, three others if I could just, share what I have and you can talk about that. Does that work? Sure. Okay. Okay. One, one second. Great. Um, I'll talk about that girl that's coming up. <laughs> so she was pretty, um, pretty active, independent walker. And, uh, you know, she's got a lot of great things, but she just um, tended to keep a leg behind a sort of a strut. And um, that increased her base of support but it really just seemed like that side of her body was a little bit harder. We didn't wanna take away her independence for ADLs and um, dressing, toileting, et cetera. Um, so we just put, uh, there's just a sleeve on her leg 
And she immediately like legs are now feet are under her body, her base of support narrowed, her balance responses were still great, but with that narrow base of support, and she spontaneously went from doing an underhand toss to trying an overhead toss with a larger ball. So that was that one. <laughs> um, okay, so this little guy um, presents with right hemiplegia. And again, he's able to ambulate independently, but showing some uh, just shorter steps, they're a little bit uneven. He's showing some increased tension in that right elbow. Um, and he's also, you know, an older school aged boy. So thinking again, you could make a case for a TLSO, like let's give some more postural trunk support. Um, but what would the cost be for independent dressing and toileting, et cetera? Um, and would he be up for doing that regularly? So for him, um, we went more the shirt and pants. And you'll notice that his stride length has improved. Um, he is, his speed has improved. Uh, there's still a little bit of that elbow flexion. And so that's where you could do a, a couple of things, maybe um, trying like a Fabriflex wrap to just give a little bit of support around the elbow, see if that helps, or add another sleeve. Um, yeah. All right, can we go to the next one? Um, let's do, can we go to the girl? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, so this young lady presents with ataxia and um, some hemiplegia, and you'll notice that she's holding on for support. Her movements are a little bit more jerky, um, she, oh, that's rewind. Um, the wall is really fantastic for her because, well, we can't appreciate it in this photo. Um, she's helping her posture and direction of movement by finding a visual target to like, I can move, I've locked on and I'm just moving toward that thing. Um, and when she got to the end, uh, this clip was just edited and it missed it, but, um, she, she's struggling to turn around and doesn't notice the step. Like that ability to scan the environment is more challenging for her. So yeah, let's go proximal for her. What's happening in her core that might be playing out more distally? Um, so the TLSO was put, um, put on and that's the middle one here. So that's the first and you'll notice she takes a few steps and then she spontaneously releases the support. So thinking again about that fear, that um, inconsistency of response and how that can play out. And now, oh, I have a better sense of where I am. I have a better sense of my balance. I'll take it from here. Thank you very much. Um, her steps are still a little jerky, but they're showing some increase in fluidity. But that elbow was still flexed. Her hand was still uh, fisted. And so, they, um, so a glove was added to the right arm. And what's cool, if you'll notice, so we start off with some flexion, actually even more on the right side. But as we go, what's happening in those arms? Boom. What's in, it, like we're seeing changes on the contralateral side. <laughs> um, so I, yes, there was influence on the left where the, you know, the orthosis was actually placed, but we're seeing changes even in other um, extremities. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And her hand is like that left hand is much softer and also starting to get a little bit of an arm swing. So this is just within a few minutes. Um, and we can imagine what that might look like over time if there was, um, just further away. All right. Thanks so much, Christy. All right. And we'll just I'm going to wrap up. Uh -huh. Here we go. All right. So ultimately, we want to be sure that these supports are enabling and not disabling. We want to foster greater um, stability and participation and movement um, and not take that away. And um, I, we didn't have a video today, but thinking about how what we watched were the more um, the less supportive items. 
our girl from that earlier movie uh, video with the sitting and standing, her scoliosis was still pretty dynamic. Um, but just thinking about timing. Yes. Oh, Kyle. Yes. I can't hear you. I just see you raised your hand. Um, I know I'm coming up on time. I've got three minutes. Um, so with this gal, if, um, if we were needing a little bit more mechanical support, something like the expedition with that X panel might give it, or if the scoliosis is really starting to concern us and we need more precise and refined um, stabilization of the spine, something like the Odyssey with that um, thermoplast back panel could give us that opportunity to add both increased mechanical support, but the precision of where that support is. Um, so I hope that helps kind of think through like how you might go through the TLSO. Um, the nice thing about the expedition is you can, you can pull the pieces out. So it might be that the child initially needs that wider X panel to, to really get that more upright position. And then as they're getting the strength, as they're starting to show more carryover, then you just start pulling the pieces off and reducing the level of support uh, without needing to order or get more parts or change things. So that um, kind of brings us to the end of our time. And I know we wanted to leave some uh, time for Q&A.